So now I'm pleased to share a presentation by AFTD's Matt Sharp and the members of our organization's Persons with FTD Advisory Council. Co-chairs Teresa Webb and Bob Madaw and council members Amy Shives, Ann Ferguson, and Steve Perlis. It's really my hope that hearing their experiences may provide you with a new perspective on this disease. Welcome to Our Voice, a discussion with people with FTD. My name is Matt Sharp, Program Manager for AFTD and Lead Staff Member for the Persons with FTD Advisory Council. I would like to introduce Amy Shives, who will take the lead and guide you through this discussion. Amy Lee lives in Spokane, Washington. Prior to her diagnosis, Amy had retired from the counseling faculty of Spokane Community College. Amy is diagnosed with behavioral variant FTD. She is one of the founding members of the Persons with FTD Advisory Council. Thank you, Matt. The members of the People with FTD Advisory Council for AFTD welcome you. We thank you for attending our conference today. We are a diverse group of people who have a diagnosis of FTD who formally advise AFTD on behalf of those diagnosed. We work to share our insights into the organization to better serve those diagnosed by expressing our viewpoints from our perspective of personally living with the disease of FTD. We believe our firsthand knowledge of living with the disease is of paramount importance in every aspect of reaching the goals that AFTD has set out to achieve as we all strive to serve all people affected by the disease. We appreciate sitting at the table, collaborating with the association for the best possible service to all persons. Today, four of our members will each speak on a topic important to all of us. Our topics include inclusion, isolation, grief, and collaboration. Our first speaker is Bob Madaw. Bob lives in Des Moines, Iowa. Prior to his diagnosis, Bob was a computer consultant and a database designer. Bob is diagnosed with behavioral variant FTD. Bob works with our council as a co-chairman. Bob will be speaking on the topic of inclusion. Welcome, Bob. Thanks, Amy. Uh, good, good afternoon and welcome to everybody uh, to the AFTD virtual conference. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about uh, inclusion and the importance that it has in the lives of people with FTD. Uh, inclusion has two main dictionary uh, definitions. One, the action or state of being included uh, within a group or structure. And two, the practice or policy of providing equal access and opportunities uh, and resources for people who might otherwise be excluded or marginalized, such as those who have a physical or mental disabilities or members of other minority groups. Over these past years, I've had the opportunity to communicate with many individuals with all forms of our disease and their loved ones. While the statement, if you've met one person with FTD, you've met one person with FTD is certainly true. We all have the need to be included in society. For those of us with FTD, we are stuck with a progressive, non-treatable, fatal disease which may be exacerbated by any number of other conditions, diabetes, heart disease, kidney disease, mental health issues, cancer, et cetera. Uh, the one thing I think we all have in common after we hear the dreaded words, I think you have frontal temporal dementia, is declining inclusion in society. People stop listening to what we say. They stop asking for our opinions. And generally, we feel shunted to the outer edges of social activities. Sometimes it may be inappropriate comments we make, telling the same story or joke over and over again, or our difficulty getting words out as fast as they want us to. Uh, we feel shunted off and cut off in our social activities. 
So whatever the reason, our social contacts tend to drift away and we suffer in isolation. And as our inclusion in various groups shrink, we lose a desire to put ourselves into that position, whether it's socially, with family, or any other larger groups of individuals. So what do we do? How do we try to stem the tide of our decline? Well, in addition to appropriate levels of exercise, we need to keep our brains active. We need to care for our overall health, including dental, vision, hearing, diet, sleep. And one of our main things is to resist the ravages of our conditions is to extend our good days, is to maintain social activity and activity with friends and family. We need to be part of the groups. We need to, to be included in activities. Our social networks need to develop and plan ways to include our abilities or lack thereof uh, in their activities and programs this all ke helps keep our brains active. Now, this is a darn tricky thing to do. Uh, we all have different issues in the many different ways FTD presents. Um, we're not a vocal group. We've already been dismissed by society since diagnosis. Uh, the medical community doesn't really know what to do with this, even if they finally do settle on a diagnosis. Uh, I left work as a computer consultant in 2001. For six years, I was tested for everything you could think of until finally somebody said, hey, let's send him to neurology. It took my first neurologist about five minutes to diagnose me with dementia. She said, well, we'll have to do additional testing to find out what kind. It's probably Alzheimer's since that's the most common, but I, I won't make that diagnosis now. Uh, so after multiple testings, finally settled it. I clearly have behavior variant FTD. Um, <clears throat> most people get diagnosed, and then it's you have two to five years to live. Go get your affairs in order while you can and prepare to die. The medical community, in most cases, is clueless on how to deal with this or how to diagnose us. Um, we're no longer included. We are the walking dead in the eyes of society. Where we are diagnosed with, where people were diagnosed with cancer, we are where people were diagnosed with cancer 60 years ago. But now there's hope for inclusion for them. Uh, cancer, most forms are treatable, if not curable. And they're included in all kinds of groups anymore. People don't uh, think of that like having FTD. They have inclusion. We will continue to push. We're not there yet, but we will get there with your help and suggestions. And thank you for listening. And Amy, back to you. Thank you, Bob. Our next speaker today is Steve Perlis. Steve lives in Buffalo Grove, Illinois. Prior to his diagnosis of behavioral variant FTD, Steve was an attorney. Steve is our newest member of our council. Steve will be speaking today on the topic of isolation. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Amy, and thanks for the introduction. Isolation is defined as the process or fact of, isolate, of being isolated. I believe that I and others like me with an FTD diagnosis can and indeed must break free from other forms of isolation and join forces in our journey to break the chains that otherwise would bind us and that keep us from living useful and productive lives. I happen to be a retired Navy Lieutenant Commander 04, same as Major in other branches of the military, judge advocate, military lawyer, retired, re retired reserves. Veterans often suffer from dementia-related isolation, which is service-connected, but often not easy to prove. I currently am trying to obtain presumptive eligibility for service members and retirees for FTD and related dementias with the help of public officials and federal at the federal and state level. 
10 years ago, I was diagnosed with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia. I was told by professionals and loved ones that within six months, I no longer would recognize close family members and I would have to be institutionalized for the rest of my life. I underwent a series of 10 electroconvulsive therapy treatments. Right away, I became fearful and anxious about having lost my memory and other coping skills. I would endlessly and compulsively write notes on my cell phone, even in the middle of a conversation with someone else. This, in turn, led to financial woes once it became clear that I no longer could practice my chosen profession, which was elder law. At my best, I was blazing trails for others to follow in protecting individuals and their families from the financial and emotional devastation caused by various forms of physical and mental disabilities, which had either occurred already or could occur at some undefined time in the future. This led to my feeling isolated from and trivialized by others whom I encountered. I was sometimes and still and still am angry that I have this diagnosis. I did nothing to cause this to happen to me. At times I wanted to just disappear, but I never fully acted out on these impulses. At the same time, I was fearful of telling my story to others, even in private. I feared that this might jeopardize my financial safety net and also alienate me from the persons to whom I told my story. I believe that unless persons like myself stand up for our rights and personal dignity, we will be marginalized by the rest of the world. For years after my diagnosis, I overcompensated by exercising excessively at my local gym, and I experienced wild mood swings frequently. On occasion, I suffered from severe depression. Now, I cope by doing cardio on my stationary bike and by doing YouTube exercises upstairs, including meditation, pranayama, back exercises, tai chi, qigong, strength exercises, as well as synagogue membership, Jewish war veterans membership. I'm adjutant to Post 89 Wheeling, Illinois, Victories of the Heart, men discussing men's issues, Zoom meetings, walking my two dogs, and various adult education classes and time spent with family members. For a while, I was told I had improved somewhat. However, my neurologist is saying that I have fallen below baseline, meaning my cognitive capabilities are below what they were prior to my having received this diagnosis. Most people whom I have encountered are clueless as to what frontotemporal dementia is. Thank you to the planners, participants, and attendees of this virtual conference for making this into a reality. I am a grateful, I am grateful to be a part of this program. I'm grateful to be anywhere. Back to you, Amy. Thank you, Steve. Ann Ferguson is from Sacramento, California. Ann is a retired registered nurse. Ann has a diagnosis of behavioral variant FTD. As a member of our council, Ann will be speaking on the topic of grief today. Welcome, Ann. Thank you, Amy. Grief is a feeling associated with some kind of loss. Those with FTD experience the used to be's and what we used to do's. My grief started at age 48. I thought I was stressed at my current job, so I changed employment. Little did I know what was in store for me. Three months into it, I was fired with no explanation. I had never been fired in my life. I spent the next months in bed depressed. I had teenage boys at home who cheered me on to get another job. I pulled myself out of bed to get out there and start hunting for a new job. Then the reality shock started. The depression, guilt, and grief were overwhelming. I stared at the walls. My husband took me to UCSF for an evaluation, and they told him I had FTD. My father died of it years before, but it wasn't called FTD at that time. They gave me three to eight years to live. It was all starting to hit me hard, even though I was in this brain fog. I was reported by UCSF to the health department, and then it went to the California DMV. They took my driver's license away, another loss, 
but I wasn't giving up yet. I contacted an attorney friend who helped me get it back. The loss here was that my family didn't think I should drive, and I was in the fight of my life all alone. I lost my job as I lost, as it, or maybe it lost me. Our family income was cut in half, and I remember the time when I finally came to the realization that things were not going back to normal. My husband insisted I apply for Social Security Disability, and I was still somewhat in denial, but I reluctantly applied. The Social Security office wanted me to see one of their psychiatrists. He interviewed me, and within 10 minutes, he told me that I couldn't work and sign the appropriate papers. I argued with him that I was still able to work. Obviously, that did no good. This was the first time my anisogonia had a reality check. What is it that other people see that I don't? Then came the menagerie medications as an attempt to control my impulses of either homicide or suicide. At one point, I was on approximately 10 different psych medications. The side effects included heart palpitations, bizarre behavior, such as wandering half or full naked outside in the middle of the night, attempting to open car door while my husband was driving, and extreme waking was just to name a few. I used to take 900 milligrams of Seroquel a day, and popping clonopin by the handful. At one point, I recall taking too much, and my son came home from a night out with his friends and scolded me for not calling him to come home sooner. I didn't want to bother him, and I ended up in the ER. My other son found me one time in the garage with the door closed and the engine on. I was banging my head on the walls and cutting myself with razor blades. My therapist and husband were collaborating together to get me admitted to a psychiatric hospital against my will. Once I got so angry that someone cut me off at the gas station and I got out of my car, started banging on the driver's side window, screaming at her. I saw myself doing this and questioned my own actions, but I couldn't stop it. Another loss and more grieving. My husband was distraught. My teenage sons weren't sure about me anymore and kept a distance unless they were doing the teenage attitude thing. Most friends and family abandoned me. Even my own son asked my husband why he stayed with me. He said most men would have left by now. I'm in the fight of my life and grieving every day. While I am currently more stable in my journey, I know that the next shoe will, I don't know when the next shoe will drop, but one thing I definitely know is I know I will feel that shoe when it drops on the floor. Why am I so open and transparent? Because I want those with this disease to know they are not alone and that I want those with, that are caregivers to know that the grief may look different but it is just as real and intense. Thank you, Anne. Teresa Webb lives in Phoenix, Arizona. Teresa is a retired registered nurse who is living with primary progressive aphasia. Teresa works with our council as co-chairwoman. Teresa will be speaking to us today on the topic of collaboration. Welcome, Teresa. Thank you, Amy. My teammates have described inclusion, grief, and isolation, what it is and how it feels in regards to their lived experience. I'm going to be discussing communication, which is a key characteristic of collaboration and apply it to the lived experience. Terry Tempest Williams, an author and writer, wrote, despair shows us the limit of our imagination. Imagination shared create collaboration, and collaboration creates community, and community inspires social change. I think this quote says so much in so few words. Those living with FTD, that being the person diagnosed, their family, 
the inner and outer circle of their communities are all affected in some way by FTD. The devastation of lives interrupted brings a vortex of disparity with hurricane force. It can be a lonely, isolated, mournful journey. However, it doesn't have to be. Once those hurricane forces settle and life with FTD has become centered, collaboration can then transpire. Collaboration is bringing people together to respond. I think the word collaboration has become overused and is very trendy. Everyone wants to have a seat at the table, but I think collaboration is more than just bringing everyone to the table. Collaboration is like an onion. There are many layers, but at the core is communication, clear and thoughtful communication. After all, without the ability to communicate, there can't be collaboration. Clear and open communication to me means being mindful of the different communication styles and adapting the way you communicate so that your voice can be heard and understood. Communication sounds simple enough, but in my world, mm, not so much. For example, I want to be able to contribute to meaningful conversations, but there are times when I get lost in the conversation. I am unable to understand what is being said. Once I begin to feel the disconnect, I will ask the person speaking to slow their speech down so that I can better follow what is being said. I live in a state of what I call forever clarifying. When I do have a seat at the collaboration table, I must ask for clarification on a concept, a sentence, or even a word. In the beginning of my FTD journey, it was uncomfortable to ask for what I needed when communicating. Just sitting at the kitchen table with my wife trying to collaborate anything from travel agenda to weekly PTOT visits was truly a frustrating nightmare for us both. I didn't understand why she didn't understand when I was trying to communicate. It took us both time, patience, and finding workarounds so that we could unlock the limits of our communication. You see, communication is the core of our life. Shared dreams and ideas are staples now in our home. I have come to realize that this whole FTD life is not a one-way journey. It's an ebb and flow filled with tide pools that can be slippery at times. For example, when the words don't flow, there's misinterpretation, jumbled or wrong order of words, voice, tone, and yes, even facial expressions can lead to frustration, anger, mistrust, tears, and unsettling behaviors. I find myself thinking, why is no one understanding me? And then I must ask myself, how can I get them to understand me? Because being understood is so important to me. I am always in search of ideas and workarounds to keep the door of communication open. Knowing if I'm going to collaborate, I must be understood and I need to understand. My FTD journey has taught me that sitting at the table is not enough. It's essential to be honest about communication, to be honest about what is needed to be heard and how to make it better so that joining the collaboration table will give everyone a voice, is done so free of judgment that I may share needs, my imaginations, and question the what ifs with confidence, knowing they will be met without being discounted simply because I am having difficulty articulating a word or a thought. That collaboration to be successful takes open minds, patience, and honesty for a common goal to reach fruitation. Please remember, FTD may rob us of our words, but it does not rob us of our intelligence. Back to you, Amy. Thank you, Teresa. Thank you for joining us today. 
As members of this advisory council, we sincerely hope that we were able to enlighten and educate our audience in the topics presented here. As we all work together to improve the lives of people living with this disease, it is our hope that we achieved our goal of demonstrating the importance of our voice. Please join us for our next breakout session immediately following our presentation today. We will be discussing how people with FTD can share their voice to improve the quality of their lives living with this disease. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Amy, Bob, Ann, Teresa, Steve, and Matt for your courage in sharing your stories today and for everything you do to inform AFTD's work. And on that note, I'd like to take a moment to especially acknowledge Amy Shive's role in helping to plan our conference. Amy, we're really grateful for everything that you've contributed to helping us provide the best and most inclusive program that we can.